The day has finally arrived when the Elizabeth Line opens for service. So we're here at Paddington are going to be riding through the call section to Abbey Wood to see the new stations. First, a brief summary of the section of the line that is opening today. TfL Rail has been operating on the Great Eastern Main Line since 2015 and on the Great Western Main Line since 2018. Today, these lines have been rebranded as part of the Elizabeth Line, but nothing about their service has changed. The core section that is opening today between Paddington and Abbey Wood is initially not connected to these sections, but will be at a later date. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Paddington Station. The entrance to the Elizabeth Line at Paddington is alongside Brunel's Great Western Railway Station, and it does a fantastic job connecting new and old. One of the subtle ways that this has been achieved is by reusing the Brunel era railings from outside the original station in the new design instead of the standard crossrail handrails. While we're outside there is an opportunity to look at the large glass canopy that covers the station while allowing large amounts of natural light down to the ticket hall and platforms. On the way down the escalator we get our first glimpse of the brick and bronze materials that have been used throughout the station. These materials were chosen as they will provide a glow when the sunlight hits them and this will provide an ambience to the station that can only be created using this method. Once through the gate line there is another escalator down to the platform level and this is where the standard design elements of the Elizabeth Line stations are phased in. This station is a box design, which means the platform area can be one wide island platform with large roundels creating seating down the middle, similar to Canary Wharf on the Jubilee Line extension. Another part of the station that will be common along this section of the line is the platform screen doors. These separate the train and running lines from the platform. While these do add a level of safety to the stations, their main purpose on this line is to control the airflow in the stations and tunnels. The screen doors also provide a place for the departure screens to be fitted. These departure screens are specific to the Elizabeth Line and use a proper display rather than the dot matrix displays that are common on the National Rail network. This is the train to Abbey Wood via Canary Wharf. Arriving at Tottenham Court Road, we get our first glimpse of the design of the tunnel stations on this section. As passengers move away from the platform area, the stations become more personalised to the locations they serve. The lighting on the platforms is provided by a large diffused light panel that runs the length of the platform above the screen doors. This station is the only tunneled station to feature a curved platform, which hides the full length of the stations and trains. Heading for the Western Ticket Hall on Dean Street, the standard design elements phase out to introduce design elements that reflect the areas of Soho that we find ourselves in. The dark walls reflect the cinemas and theatres that can be found nearby. The Eastern Ticket Hall provides the connection to the Central and Northern Lines. The next station is Farringdon, where the Elizabeth Line connects to the other cross London railway, Thameslink. The platforms here are similar to those at Tottenham Court Road, but this time they are completely straight, allowing us to see the scale of how long these trains and platforms are when compared to the underground. As we've covered the platform design already at Tottenham Court Road, we're going to head straight up to the ticket halls to see the station's unique characteristics. The Western Ticket Hall at Farringdon connects through to the existing Thameslink Ticket Hall. It features many references to metalwork and jewellery, which are both industries that this area was known for and is still known for respectively. The ceiling also contains a diamond pattern that can be seen best when travelling down the escalators.
The Eastern Ticket Hall features a design that references the nearby Barbican Centre with an almost brutalist architectural style, while the glass contains a similar pattern to that of Smithfield Market, which is only a short walk from here. Alighting the train at Liverpool Street, the platform design is clearly the same as the last, but there's one thing to see here. At previous stations, we've seen the totems that hold the signage and lighting. But here at Liverpool Street, there is what has been referred to as a totem forest. The central interchange corridor between the platforms has a vast number of these totems running the entire length. The Western Ticket Hall is located in Moorgate and features a large amount of blue glass panelling to stand out on the street. The Eastern Ticket Hall is located outside the main line station at Liverpool Street on Broadgate and it features a five metre tall glass canopy that covers the escalators down to the Ticket Hall. Once inside the Ticket Halls, it is clear to see that this is the first station where the design motifs are common to both Ticket Halls. The most striking feature is the ceiling, which features angled panelling that is then grooved to reflect the pinstripes of workers in the nearby offices of the city. As we arrive at the last tunnel station at Whitechapel, it is very important to be in the right place on the train, as these platforms only have one exit into the existing London Underground and London Overground ticket hall. One of the unique implementations of the standard design here at Whitechapel is that the escalators use the standard design for most of the journey up to the ticket hall, and then it rapidly opens out to create as large and as open a space as possible with the concrete wrapping round the corner into a giant arc. When up at the ticket hall level, you are taken over a bridge that has the London Overground running directly beneath it, and then there are windows on each side to let natural light down to those platforms. The outside of the station is the same as it always has been, with an exit out onto Whitechapel Road, but it's been refurbished during the construction work. Arriving at Canary Wharf, we see the station is reverted back to the box style, similar to Paddington, and features one wide island platform. Already it can be seen there's a mix of standard design elements and other features around the platforms. The roundels, platform signage and totems are the same as they have been at other stations, but there's an unmissable yellow accent to the escalators. Moving up to the ticket hall, one of the interesting parts of the design is the slatted ceiling. This helps with sound dampening, and when viewed from an angle appears to be solid, but when viewed from directly beneath, some of the wiring and ducting that is normally kept out of sight can be seen. Once outside the station, a sense of scale can be seen, with Crossrail Place above the station. The station at Custom House is the first we pass through today where we're completely out in the open. Because of this, some of the standard station design elements were implemented very differently from the other stations, while others have been missed entirely. As it is completely outside, the lighting has been done very differently here. The mezzanine level where the gate line is has air-filled bags between the roof beams. This means on a sunny day, light is allowed to pass through, but when it rains, there is some protection. The station building also fits very well into the surroundings. Off to the side is Freemasons Road, which meets the main road at an 18 degree angle. This angle has been used throughout the station, resulting in the station being a parallelogram when viewed from above. The station is accessed from a footbridge over Victoria Dock Road and provides the connection with the DLR and access to the Excel Centre. Entering the penultimate station for today's journey, we are greeted by another wide island platform like Paddington and Canary Wharf. The immediately noticeable part of Woolwich station design is on the columns and the coloured banding that surrounds them. The colours represent the Royal Artillery and the Royal Engineers which were located at Woolwich Arsenal. 
moving up the escalator towards the ticket hall. We can see there's a large amount of natural light being let into the station by skylights above the ticket hall. The station opens out onto Dial Arch Square, and this location was chosen to try and add a new focal point to Woolwich on this side of Plumstead Road. Abbey Wood Station is the only station we're visiting today that is not strictly new. The station building opened in 2017 and has been serving South Eastern and Thameslink. But this is the first day where you can now get down onto the new platforms that are specifically for the Elizabeth Line. The ticket hall features a large curved roof that is lined with timber on the inside. This was done as trees could not be placed around the entrance due to the station being on a bridge. The Elizabeth Line platforms are located on a long island platform that is covered for most of the length, with a small part out in the open around the footbridge. And this concludes all the new stations that have opened today as part of the core section of the Elizabeth Line. But what about Bond Street? Bond Street station was always intended to open later than the other stations in the core section. This is reportedly because of challenges with the station design, so for now, trains will pass through the station without stopping. It currently has no publicly scheduled opening date, but publicity and signage suggest that we shouldn't have to wait too long, with the station opening soon. While the Crossrail project may be nearly four years late and has run over budget, it is clear that this line has been very much needed and will transform the way that people travel to and around the capital for many decades to come.